So thanks again, Stephen, for being here. And then also for all of you joining, um, uh, we have a, a great discussion happening today and we're covering some of the basics of the what and why of Bitcoin. Um, obviously, you probably, you've, you've obviously all know about Bitcoin, but there's been a lot of news recently just with a lot of the excitement and interest that's been spiked uh, over the last couple of weeks and months. Um, and so we're going to kind of give a, a, a or we, I say, I mean, Stephen's going to give a bit of an overview and, and then, um, and then give a uh, open up for a bit of Q and a. So, uh, I'm going to introduce Steven here and he's a, he's a startup investor and founder of, uh, OC Bitcoin network. And before that he, uh, was, uh, about 10 years or so of leading uh, web, t you know, technology teams in Silicon Valley. Um, and it was at companies such as eBay cloud scaling and Intel, um, and now his interests are around uh, investing um, in, in privacy, decentralization, and then obviously in, in the crypto space, specifically Bitcoin. So Stephen, thanks so much for being here and uh, the floor is yours. Very cool, appreciate the intro, Tyler. Um, appreciate the opportunity to come and chat and for everybody who's joined here. Uh, in addition to Bitcoin having a special place in my heart and being one of my favorite things to talk about, I'm also a Missouri native. So I know this organization is kind of uh, rooted in St. Louis. I was born in Kansas City and went to school down in Joplin in Southwest Missouri. So uh, closest friends are still there and I'm still back in Missouri all the time. Um, so it's extra special to be able to come and share this with you all. The way I figure we'll structure it is I have some slides and the goal is to give everybody here kind of a baseline on just what Bitcoin is. And hopefully you will find some parts interesting, even if you're already pretty familiar with Bitcoin. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about some considerations. If you are an entrepreneur and you're considering building something in the Bitcoin space, or if you're an investor thinking about investing either into Bitcoin or Bitcoin companies. And, uh, and then I want to leave time for Q&A because I find that this is such a big multifaceted topic that oftentimes that's where the, the best types of interactions and dialogue happen. So do feel free along the way, if uh, there's a specific thing we're going over and you have a specific question on that, feel free to, you know, unmic, shout it out, keep this all pretty casual. But otherwise, I will try to carve out, you know, uh, at least a half hour, if not longer, for questions at the end. And I'm going to attempt to uh, to share my screen here. Beautiful. Okay. So uh, the, the quick logo filled slide about me and Tyler already mentioned some of this in the intro. I've been in the web engineering space since 2007. After growing up in the Midwest, I spent about 10 years in Silicon Valley. Uh, working for companies like eBay and Intel, an AI deep learning startup called Nirvana Systems, which was acquired by Intel. And then today I still advise a nonprofit organization, Code to Inspire. Um, we're a 5013C based in New York and um, actually have a school in Afghanistan. We teach young girls how to write software and kind of arm them with the, uh, the skills that they need if they want to pursue a career in tech um, and get hired. Uh, and then in terms of investing, so I've, I've kind of been into Bitcoin since 2013. That was a passion outside of my full-time job initially and has in recent years become the full-time focus. Uh, so since 2017 and especially 2018, my primary focus has been on investing not only into Bitcoin, but into um, technology startups. And most of those startups are focused around Bitcoin and in the Bitcoin ecosystem. A uh, few examples are the logos there in the bottom right. So if any of you are already into Bitcoin, you may recognize some of them. Um, Swan is a way to purchase Bitcoin in the US, a retail exchange. Casa is a Bitcoin storage uh, solution if you want to hold your coins long term in a very robust way. Uh, and then Satoshi Energy, Samurai Wallet, um, among some others. Sorry for the uh, <laughs> all right, little little technical difficulty there. This no was worries. the slide that I thought that you all were seeing yeah. when I was uh, discussing earlier. Okay. So, um, yeah. you know, web engineering did I Bitcoin did. since 2013, and startup investing has been the focus of the last few years for me. Oh, sorry. Um, so, quick rundown of just the very basics, kind of a Bitcoin 101. What is Bitcoin? There are a few terms that are key to understand in that. So the first is it's open source software. And the important takeaway there is just that open source means there's no secrets. 
Uh, anyone in the world with the interest and the capability can go and look through Bitcoin's software code base and see exactly what it's doing. It's not like some other software products like Microsoft Windows, where you sort of have to trust that there is nothing malicious in the code, um, because that would be closed source. Because Bitcoin is open, uh, anyone can be confident that whoever created it did not embed some backdoor. There's nothing malicious there. There's nothing that's uh, lurking, waiting to bite us later. It's also decentralized. So there's no single you know, entity, corporation, individual in control of the system. It's kind of similar to the internet, right? Google is a big participant in the internet. Cisco is a big participant in the internet, but none of them really strictly own the internet or control the internet. It's this big peer-to-peer -peer system. Uh, and it's built on a blockchain. You've probably heard the word blockchain a lot by now. The notion of a blockchain was born with Bitcoin. And that's essentially this data structure under the hood that kind of lets Bitcoin, uh, it's like the engine of Bitcoin. So it lets it accomplish um, its, you know, desired user experience of kind of being money and being this, this scarce monetary asset. It's a uh, monetary network, so you know you can send and receive Bitcoin. Uh, it's essentially a global protocol for money. And then in addition to the network that does that transferring, the word Bitcoin also refers to the units that are being transferred on that network. So you'll see BTC as an abbreviation, and then there's an even smaller unit called SATs that you may not have seen yet, but that's another that is important to know about and is going to become much more prominent soon. So a SAT is the smallest unit of a Bitcoin. Every Bitcoin can be divided up into very tiny pieces, 100 million pieces, and one 100 millionth of a Bitcoin, the smallest slice, is called a SAT. And those are the units that are stored and transferred around on this global network, this monetary network, this protocol for money. Um, it wasn't very practical to think about SATs initially because Bitcoin itself wasn't very valuable, but the higher the Bitcoin price rises, the more important SATs are going to be. Because if it rises far enough, it might get to the point where the day-to-day -day units for things aren't easy to conceptualize as you know, or to measure as Bitcoin, it would be more convenient to measure them as sats. Uh, rather than saying 0. 0.00001 BTC, you could say something like, you know, 100,000 sats. And that's, that's a lot easier if you're thinking day-to-day -day transactions, maybe like buying a coffee someday. So those are some of the things that Bitcoin is. It's also important to emphasize one thing Bitcoin is not. It's not just another... PayPal or Venmo or Visa or bank or centralized money transmitter. So I was guilty of this initially. When I discovered Bitcoin, I kind of shrugged it off at first because I thought we don't need another way to send money. You know, we've already got all these different apps. It feels like there's a new one every week, You're kind of exhausted with it. And it took me much longer to realize that Bitcoin is not just a new way to send money. It's a new type of money entirely. And that is a very different game and a very different value proposition. A uh, quick little detour just through Bitcoin history, because the story of its origins is not only fascinating, but kind of important. It was invented by Satoshi Nakamoto back in 2008, in late 2008. And Satoshi sent an email to a list of cryptographers and sort of online you know, technology hacker types. And that message there is actually a screenshot of Satoshi's original email. He'd been working on a new electronic cash system that's fully peer-to-peer -peer with no trusted third party. And it included a link to the Bitcoin white paper, which is, uh, has become you know, an object of, uh, of legend nowadays. And with that, Bitcoin was born and Satoshi implemented the software and released it just a few months after that. The plot twist is that no one knows who Satoshi is. And uh, because that's true, we don't even necessarily know that it's a he. So Satoshi is a Japanese male name. So that's why a lot of people use he to, to refer to Satoshi. But maybe we don't know who she is. And maybe we don't know who they are. It could even be a group of people. So it's kind of intriguing. And it might seem initially like kind of a turnoff if you don't know where this thing came from, right? You don't know who created it. But... I believe it gives Bitcoin a lot of strength because it makes it more resilient to social attacks. If we knew Satoshi's identity, we would probably be 
judging that person, you know, looking at their Facebook history, everything they've done in their life, their political preferences, all kinds of things, and perhaps using that to convince people that Bitcoin is or isn't a good idea based on the creator. But because we don't know that information, it forces everyone to just kind of judge Bitcoin for Bitcoin. It forces the idea to stand on its own. And it has the additional benefit of uh, making it resilient to social attacks. So if there were some influential figurehead or ruler or especially like CEO of Bitcoin, you could try to blackmail that person. You could try to bribe that person. You could try to use that person to influence change and, and kind of shape Bitcoin in some way. But because we don't know Satoshi's identity, you can't really attack Bitcoin that way in the same way that you can with other systems. The really big breakthrough, in my opinion, what makes Bitcoin special is that Satoshi solved the problem of digital scarcity. For most of our lives, um, it's just been this internet of abundance. So there's, it's easy to copy files around. Um, the idea of something on computers that's digital also being limited doesn't really compute at first. I have a computer science background and I remember thinking when I heard that Bitcoin is limited that you know, uh, like, no, it's not. That, that was my initial reflex, right? Like, no, it's not. That's not how computers work. If you have one file, you can just create a copy and that's easy. Um, but Bitcoin, I think, is the first time that that problem has really been solved. So there will only be a certain number of Bitcoin that ever exist, and there can never be more than that. And all of the internet, all of computing, that's never been true until Bitcoin. So I think that's a really big, potentially world-changing deal. Diving in a little bit to the details of that scarcity, there's only going to be 21 million Bitcoin maximum that can ever exist. Uh, those can, as we mentioned earlier, be subdivided. So it's not like only 21 million people could ever own any Bitcoin at all. You don't need to transact in entire units of a Bitcoin. You can own a fraction of a Bitcoin. So when you do all of that division, there's 2.1 quadrillion Satoshis. So the smallest unit, there's 2.1 quadrillion of. So that is definitely enough to go around um, for every person to have some uh, and then some and to kind of be global money just in terms of, uh, of that distribution. It's Those Bitcoin are created by a process called mining. Mining gets pretty technical pretty quickly. So if there's anyone interested in that, we can kind of dive in in Q&A afterwards. But otherwise, I plan to not really go too much into the guts of mining just because it is a pretty big topic. But the important takeaways are, you know, there's this predictable rate at which all of those 21 million Bitcoin are brought into existence. And that process is referred to as mining. And that schedule is set. It was set when Bitcoin was created. So the rate of creation of all these new Bitcoin gets cut in half every four years. So when the network started back in 2009, Bitcoin were being created really, really quickly, like 50 of them every 10 minutes. And then four years later, that rate got cut in half. And then it was 25 every 10 minutes. And then four years after that, it got cut in half again. And then it was 12.5 every 10 minutes. And it's been cut in half again since then. So right now it's about 6.25 every 10 minutes. And that halving will continue every four years. So even though about 80% of the Bitcoin that'll ever exist have already been found, they're already in circulation, uh, the last tiny sliver of a Bitcoin won't be found for a really long time, over 100 years from now. And proof of work is uh, a concept, it, it helps provide network security. So you'll kind of see these articles that frame Bitcoin negatively, they'll say it consumes a lot of power, a lot of electricity, and it's bad for the environment. Um, and I don't agree with that characterization at all. Um, proof of work serves a super important purpose. It, it is what helps make Bitcoin secure against attack. If it were not for that cost, um, people having to expend real resources to, to try to mine Bitcoin, then it would simply be that whoever has the most computers on the network wins. Um, if Google or Facebook or Amazon they have millions of servers. If they just took those servers and they had them try to like overwhelm the Bitcoin network and put a bunch of false information out there about like who's paying who and who's got how much money, then they would be able to do that, right? Because it would essentially just be a vote based on the number of computers you have. But we don't want it to work that way. Um, we don't want whoever has the most computers to be able to dictate the truth. And that is really what proof of work helps provide. So 
Um, it makes sure that if someone tries to falsify a Bitcoin transaction or act in some malicious way, it actually costs them money to do that. It's not going to be free. It's not going to be cheap. Um, they would have to spend a lot of money on electricity even to try to attack Bitcoin. And so the more total energy usage of the network, the more it is kinds of attacks. And then really the most takeaway from all this is that that was details about the creation rate, um, those core rules of Bitcoin, they're virtually impossible to change. And that is super important. I think that's what sets Bitcoin apart from all of the thousands of other cryptocurrencies. You've probably heard of a bunch of them. There's like Ethereum, there's Litecoin, there's Ripple, there's many. Um, and I think what makes Bitcoin special is that it's the one that can't be changed. Even if there are theoretical limits that are in the software of these other coins, they're usually centralized enough that that number is still up for debate. Uh, it's typically controlled by a small enough number of nodes on the network or even just a small enough group of influential developers that if they really wanted to change the schedule uh, at which some other coins are created, they totally could. Um, the Ethereum community has done that many times. I suspect they will continue to do it many more times. And so what I love about Bitcoin is the certainty and predictability that you get. We know that you can't ever inflate that money supply. This is kind of a wild statement, but it is fun to consider. It's more predictable, Bitcoin is more predictable than any other asset in the history of humankind. So the only thing I think that really comes close uh, is, is time. Our time is definitely limited, but who knows if some breakthrough in technology will let us live longer, um, or who knows if we will go out and like have an accident or a piano falls on our head and we don't have as much time as we expected to have. Um, so Bitcoin is the most predictably scarce asset ever. Uh, we don't know how much gold is in the Earth's crust. We certainly don't know how much is in asteroids or the solar system. We definitely don't know how many dollars there are, and they change that all the time. So there's, you know, there's no real scarcity anywhere else. They always tell us it's the last Star Wars movie. It's the last Kanye West album. And it's usually a lie, right? It's easy to make more of things if there's a, mo if there's a financial incentive to do so. Uh, but Bitcoin, no matter how lucrative it would be to try to print more Bitcoin and create more than 21 million, no one can. And that is completely unique in history, I believe. This is a quote from the creator of Bitcoin. The root problem with conventional currency is all the trust required to make it work. The central bank must be trusted not to debase the currency, which means to print more, essentially. Uh, but the history of fiat currencies is full of breaches of that trust. So Satoshi is not around any longer, and we can't really know what Satoshi's exact intentions were. But I do think quotes like this are really interesting. I think he... Uh, displayed a distrust of these institutions that were responsible for the money. And uh, we've witnessed, you know, it's early 2021 as we're recording this. And last year in 2020, the central banks printed trillions of dollars. And whether or not that's a good thing, whether or not it was justified, um, you know, it makes the savings of everyone worth less. So if you have dollars and they're sitting in a savings account, and then over here, these bankers are able to just quietly create more dollars out of thin air, then your dollars won't be able to buy as much stuff. Me meaning like the price of everything will rise. Groceries will get more expensive. Furniture gets more expensive. And I believe that Satoshi saw that. I certainly see that as the ability to kind of steal from people who are trying to save. And so that's one thing that makes me really excited about Bitcoin is it almost provides people a defensive technology where they can protect their wealth in a way that they know cannot be debased. When you stack Bitcoin up next to other forms of money like gold or um, fiat, and fiat refers to you know, nation state currencies like dollars, yen, pesos, um, it's really interesting to, to look at how it compares. So it's really easy to verify that Bitcoin is genuine. You can do it with an app on a phone and some software. Uh, it's really expensive to try to like determine if gold is real, right? Or if it's actually tungsten pretending to be gold. You need like an x-ray machine or some complicated machinery to do that. Uh, dollar bills are pretty easy to counterfeit. Um, it's very hard to send gold to the other side of the world, so it's not very portable. It's really easy to send Bitcoin around. So you can kind of look at the, you know, 
green, yellow, red here and get an idea of how Bitcoin stacks up. But I think one really interesting thing to observe is that the only area where Bitcoin is really weak is established history. And so it certainly doesn't have the familiarity or the reputation of gold, um, you know, or even dollars, which have been around since the 70s. Uh, but if you kind of invert that statement, it's a little bit fun because that means that all Bitcoin needs is time. All that it needs to do, it's already stronger in all of these other ways that make money good money. So all it really needs to do is continue to be that. And the more that people learn about it, the, the more it gets that established history and that trust. And then eventually people might realize that it's stronger than gold, it's stronger than dollars. They should perhaps put some of their savings that they are protecting in gold or dollars into Bitcoin. And if that continues long enough, then uh, Bitcoin may gain that reputation. A quick economics kind of note um, on just how money happens. And I wanted to highlight this because it was so important for me in my Bitcoin journey. There are these four phases of adoption that occur when something is becoming money. And I initially wrote off Bitcoin because I thought, well, you know, it's too volatile. Like, how could you list prices in Bitcoin? If you're a restaurant owner and you try to list the price of a sandwich in Bitcoin, you're going to have to run around and change the price all the time because there are these, these volatile swings. And so therefore, Bitcoin can't be good money. And that was kind of my reasoning at the time. But the more that I read the writings of historians like Nick Sabo um, and other economists, the more I realized that adoption of money happens in phases. And first, it's just a collectible. It may not even have any real you know, sort of dollar value per se. Uh, then it's a store of value. It's just people holding it to protect their savings. And then only if it really crushes it at that and does a great job, then it really starts to shine as a medium of exchange, which means paying for things and transferring money around. And then lastly, only if it's amazing at all of the above, then it gets to unit of account, which means conceptualizing prices in it and thinking about listing prices in it. And so when you think about it as that type of progression, it makes you a lot more comfortable holding Bitcoin because, um, or the idea that Bitcoin could someday be fantastic money because all that it might need is time for more, more value to flow into it in order for it to progress to those later stages of being, uh, of, of its monetization, you could say. So I think right now, that's where we are. We are in the store of value phase. And Bitcoin's not great for paying for stuff today. There are some really neat apps, like if you are, if you have certain privacy considerations, if you're in unique circumstances and you need uncensorable payments, it is powerful for that. So I don't want to understate that. But for sort of the average person um, with access to financial infrastructure, credit cards are pretty convenient for paying for stuff. Dollars are very convenient for listing prices. So I think it's premature to want Bitcoin to be those things right now today, because it's simply best used as a store of value right now. Even if somewhere accepts Bitcoin, I usually just recommend holding it. Um, not many people know that there are only ever 21 million Bitcoin. And so I think the name of the game right now is to buy it and to hoard it and to just accumulate as much as you can. And I see it similar to the gold rush. It's almost the digital equivalent of the gold rush, right? If you realized that gold was valuable before anyone else in the world, then you could go out and you could like stake a claim to it or walk off with wheelbarrows of it. And, uh, and that'd be pretty easy to do and cheap to do. And you could secure a lot of wealth before people realized how special that asset was. And I think that's exactly where we are with Bitcoin, except um, perhaps even more of an opportunity because Bitcoin is much stronger than gold. And that leads to a point I really want to drive home is that holding Bitcoin is using Bitcoin. So often you'll hear people when you mention Bitcoin, they'll say, well, yeah, but where can I use it? And what they probably mean is where can I pay for things with it? Where like does the store accept it? Can I go buy stuff with it? And that's certainly a form of using it, but it's not the only form. Um, money isn't just for paying for stuff. Money is for savings. And I think Bitcoin is the best savings technology that's ever existed. And so right now, if you just simply have Bitcoin that you bought a year ago and you haven't transferred those, then you know the way I see it, you have been using Bitcoin every day to protect your wealth and, and to increase your wealth. And I think that's actually the premier use case for Bitcoin right now. 
Uh, a little bit of considerations for kind of building or investing in Bitcoin companies. I know this is a very entrepreneurial focused group um, and, and kind of talk a lot about startups and so forth. And that is a big part of my world as well. So this, uh, the obvious caveat is these are all just kind of my opinions on the industry and the ecosystem. And we'll wait and see how reality plays out. But uh, these are some considerations that I would encourage you, interesting thought experiments, if nothing else, when looking at the Bitcoin ecosystem. The first is to measure your returns against better money. So uh, if you make Bitcoin your money, then it kind of changes what you're willing to invest in. If Bitcoin didn't exist, I'd probably invest in a lot more tech startups because it would be a lot easier to outperform dollars than it would be to outperform Bitcoin. But if you as an individual investor or as a venture capital fund, if your money is Bitcoin, if your baseline performance is Bitcoin and you only invest into startup companies that can offer a return against Bitcoin, then I think that's a really powerful paradigm shift. And you can, you know, it doesn't just apply to startups. A good example are other cryptocurrencies. So you probably saw people in recent weeks celebrating that some other cryptocurrencies were reaching all-time high prices. You know, there was like, I think Ethereum, <laughs> I see the, the Doge t-shirt, love it, nice. I will, I will absolutely give respect to, I love a good meme and Doge is by far the most amazing uh, meme game. So respect to, to Doge and the Inu. Um, the, I'll, I'll say though, like it, when analyzing returns of other cryptocurrencies like Ethereum, you know, I, I don't think Ethereum reached an all-time high recently because it's only at an all-time high if you compare, if, if you're measuring against dollars. It's nowhere near the all-time high if you're measuring it relative to Bitcoin. And so when you, when you start to use Bitcoin to measure against, then, uh, then I think it almost is this forcing function for a quality over quantity type of approach to investing that I like a lot. The other thing I'd encourage is to look for opportunities. This is especially true if you're thinking about building something, starting a company. Look for what money can't do, what money has not been able to do in the past. So there's a lot of people out there who are building great Bitcoin companies to kind of, you know, do stuff that we know money's been able to do, right? So if uh, someday maybe we'll walk in and buy lunch in Bitcoin at the register and there'll be like a startup that does that, or maybe Square decides to do that. And sure, like that will probably happen. That'll probably be the future. But that's a very obvious thing, right? Because it's like, it, we already do it with the money we have today. And so we'll probably do it with the money of tomorrow if that ends up being Bitcoin. But what's interesting is there's a lot of, there are a lot of use cases that become possible now that we have this digital global protocol for money for things money has never been able to do. It's never been possible before to send a fraction of a penny to someone around the world in a different continent instantly. And maybe the future of the internet is kind of like that. Maybe Bitcoin is just woven into these protocols. Maybe every time you load a web page or you send an email or you stream a YouTube video, you are paying in real time over the wire, like fractions of a cent or a cent or whatever rate is appropriate based on supply and demand, how much you want it, how much they want for it, um, to, to kind of weave this into internet protocols, to call a REST API should you know, a REST API, um, for those of you with kind of web engineering context, uh, that's a big pillar of how the internet works. And if a REST API can charge a price in Bitcoin before it does work, then like advertise that price with no identity connected to it, then I think that could lead to a much more efficient and uh, accessible internet for everyone. And we could do away with this complicated web of middlemen and advertisers that we have today. Because I think the only reason we have that complicated web of middlemen and advertisers, the only reason that you have to you know, have this disjointed experience where an ad pops into the middle of your Hulu video or whatever is because you haven't really had the ability to pay. There's not been a protocol for money. So you can't pay in very small amounts, but now with Bitcoin, we can. And uh, maybe some, I hope to see even more startups and entrepreneurs go out and build things to that end. Think about 
what's possible now that hasn't been before. And then this is going to be a very controversial slide, um, but my the the way that I kind of see the industry, my my thesis on it is that. Um, blockchain and crypto aren't nearly as big of a deal as Bitcoin. Um, I, I tend to be very skeptical. I've heard, you know, hundreds of pitches over the years, and I haven't really seen anything compelling for a blockchain use case or another cryptocurrency. I think some of them are, you know, backed by brilliant people trying to build amazing things. But I think that a lot of what is being built on other platforms and other blockchains today is ultimately going to migrate. I think it's going to end up living on top of Bitcoin. Now that Bitcoin is a lot more stable and these layers on top of it, such as the Lightning Network, such as Rootstock, such as RGB and Liquid, um, you know, we can we can do we can issue tokens on these Bitcoin based platforms now, which was not easily possible before. So, you know, Ethereum and these other chains have kind of been the only place to experiment with this stuff that's been accessible for the last few years. But in my view, that's exactly what it is. It's experimentation. And I, I kind of see this future in which Bitcoin's blockchain ends up being the main blockchain, if not literally the only blockchain. And then all of these other use cases that you know, might be great. Like some of the DeFi stuff I'm enthused about. I, uh, I'm kind of cautiously optimistic on NFTs. Maybe I'm still figuring out all the details there, but I don't think that, uh, that they're sustainable where they're at. I think that ultimately they'll need to find a home at one of these layers on top of Bitcoin or directly on top of Bitcoin. And that's the point at which I get really interested in analyzing it and uh, as an investment opportunity or, um, you know, kind of as a, as a long-term solution to a problem. Uh, and then if you want more information on Bitcoin, why it's a big deal, the impact it might have on the world, these are some books that I love and would recommend. The first is a very tiny, succinct read. It's a great intro. Uh, it's called The Little Bitcoin Book. The middle one is uh, kind of from an economics perspective, written by Safety and Amus, the Bitcoin standard, and it gives a history of different types of monies and how Bitcoin compares as money and its value proposition through that lens. And then the last one is especially fascinating because it has nothing to do with Bitcoin per se. It was written before Bitcoin existed. It was written back in 1997 before even the internet of today was as big of a deal. And it makes some pretty bold predictions about how the future will look once internet, once the internet's created and especially once internet money is created. And so it almost describes Bitcoin's impact on the world before Bitcoin existed and without using the name. Um, but it talks about how technology determines the way that society is organized. And if we have these big shifts in technology, which, you know, maybe Bitcoin represents, then that could actually change some ways that we organize our society um, and kind of the balance of power. And so it's a really cool read if you want to, uh, to dive down some rabbit holes of thought around the, the bigger societal picture.